my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, he has been one of my best friends since we met at one of Zechariah Sitchin's seminars in Los Angeles in, I believe, the year 2000. Uh, he is, uh, besides the webmaster being many sites, one of them is xfacts.com. Uh, Jason Martell has done numerous television interviews, radio show interviews, many of which he's invited me to join him, and we've participated together on Coast to Coast a couple times, plus other shows. I think he's one of the best web programmers and one of the leaders in web technology around today. Uh, his research into uh, not only Planet X, but other ancient technology, like the ancient Iraq battery and other things, is astounding. Uh, I think you'll find his presentation insightful and very clearly presented. Um, Jason Martel. All right, thank you so much, Eric, and thank you everyone for coming today. It was like we're having a great turnout. Now, I have a plethora of slides to go through today, so I might be a little fast, but basically I'm just going to kind of give you a visual overload. So what I'm going to be talking about today is ancient technology. All throughout history, there are forms of artifacts that have been found from various cultures that have been miscategorized, if you will, as insect models or some type of sculpture that mainstream archaeology doesn't give it the classification that we're going to put it under tonight. So ancient technology. All throughout history, there are artifacts that have been discovered that have a very anomalous origin and their function and purpose isn't quite accepted by mainstream science. This one, known as the Antikythera mechanism, served two purposes. It was a, an astronomical device so that you could chart where you are off the stars and, and navigating through the seas and using the stars as a navigation point. And it was also an astrological tool where people could tell you, ah, oh, if you were born on March 15th, then your planet sign is Mars, and these things are likely to happen to you. So it was a very interesting device, but what intrigued scholars is that it was more complex than a modern day Swiss watch as far as the inner workings of the cogs and gears. So this is a very complex object to have come out of history, and it's dated back to around 250 BC. So, very interesting piece of technology. And here you can see what it would have looked like fully assembled in its encasing. Okay. So, another interesting area of uh, technology, this is something that Georgie and I, Giorgio and I just recently um, rehearsed in, in, a, in a show called Ancient Aliens, where in Egypt, there are wall reliefs that clearly show light bulbs. And one of the alternative theories as to how they got all these very intricate wall reliefs and hieroglyphics is, one, they were using a torch, the other theory is they were using copper reflective mirrors. When you look into these deep recesses of tombs, there are no carbon soot on the walls. I mean, there's no flame, evidence of flame having been burnt. So the only other theory by mainstream science is copper mirrors reflecting the light down these long tunnels, and that just doesn't cut it. An alternative theory is that they were actually harnessing electricity. And we see from these wall reliefs that there are clear inscriptions of what look to be a light bulb, a very large light bulb plugged into some type of power source. Now what's interesting about these depictions is that again, if this is a light bulb, then it would need some type of power source. And so interestingly enough, in that same time frame of around 2500 BC, we find what look to be batteries. And this is found in Iraq, and it's called the Baghdad battery. It's basically just a clay pot with a copper lining and an iron rod down the center. But when you apply a voltmeter to this, you actually generate a positive charge by using any type of acidic acid or excuse me, acidic liquid. So vinegar, grape juice, wine, and you touch these two uh, rods together and it actually is generating a positive volt. And we were able to get on film four volts from using an object about this size. You figure a modern day battery is around nine volts that powers our flashlights. Maybe multiply this by 200 and have a huge vat and you could be generating a significant amount of electricity. Ancient engineering. All over the earth we have these structures of uh, advanced engineering that if you ask the local people, where do these structures come from? They say they were built by the gods. So how far back do these go? Some of the structures uh, found, for instance, in Kumapuku have unbelievable advanced technology, yet these stones are thousands of years old. Who could have possibly have done this? The only people that we can date back in mainstream science would be people that are using stone tools and living in clay huts, yet they have advanced precision drilling. You can see here on the far right side of your screen um, that there is actually a mold for molten metal to be poured and to fasten these blocks together. 
Um, we can see precision drilling in some of these holes. And the, lock, and the blocks fit together like Legos. So very advanced engineering for a culture that's now basically uh, extinct as to you know, who could have built these. So it goes very far back into antiquity. And as Eric mentioned, these famous, this infamous stone in Baalbek, and again you can see the perspective of a human standing on these stones. These stones were left broken at the quarry site and then stacked five miles away. And we know that because here are the stones, one left at the quarry site that cracked. But interestingly enough, all over the world we have these pyramidal structures, and a lot of them seem to be astronomically aligned to star constellations. So we're seeing astroarchaeology appear all over the world in a pyramidal form, and it really begs the question as to what they were trying to tell us. And uh, obviously, through the work of Eric von Daniken and, and Giorgio Tuscolos, I always say your name wrong, it's Tuscolos. Sus Actually, it's Miller. We see we see structures all over Europe with 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 the suggestion that there could be a correlation with the planets in the solar system. Pyramids actually marking places in the solar system as actual planets and laying these out as geographical points. So it's very interesting information to start to correlate some of this ancient knowledge and say, you know, this couldn't have, di this couldn't have uh, just been by chance. Some of these pyramids in South America have very strong correlations to Egypt. The base pyramid size of some of these pyramids exactly match the base pyramids of Giza, and they're aligned to the actual true north in such a way where even the Eiffel Tower doesn't match the precision of these pyramids and their alignment. And you can see the vastness of the, uh, of, you know, what we're talking about here, they take up quite, quite a bit of space. So when we look at some of these more infamous ones like Giza, again, amazing knowledge that can be derived from this. Using star, car, star constellation maps and computer mapping software, we can basically tell you when the stars are going to be above you and at a certain time in the sky. Meaning a week from now, go outside in front of your house, look at the northern sky and you're going to see Orion. Great. You can also go backwards in time and know exactly where constellations showed up over the Earth. And it turns out in 10,500 BC, Orion, the three stars with one slightly offset, is exactly above the star, is exactly above Giza's three pyramids, as you can see as a satellite photo, three pyramids, one slightly offset. In 10,500 BC, we have a terrestrial connection where the, the, the objects on the ground are emulating Orion and the, 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 the Sphinx, which is the object of a, of a lion, is gazing directly east into the constellation of Leo, a lion. So in 10,500 BC, we have an astronomical alignment. Why? Who built these? Egyptologists claim that these were built 2,500 BC by the Egyptians. Sure. Yet it's aligned to the stars <laughs> in 10,500 BC. So there's a 8,000 year discrepancy where modern Egyptology says, well, we don't accept that they could have gone that far back. And there's actually even water erosion on the Sphinx so heavily that the last time there could have been floods of that magnitude in the deserts of Giza would have been 10,000 years ago, roughly, when we had a great flood. So again, some of these pyramids uh, in Egypt, very interesting things. Here's the Bent Pyramid. This one actually just became open to the public due to their tourism needs to expand Giza and make some of the parts that were not so heavily off limits. Now it's like, oh, come, come and see the pyramids. So ancient uh, astronomy. Uh, a very interesting fact is that the 12 constellations of the, the 12 houses of the zodiac, if you will, is basically a, a division of the, uh, of the heavens into 12 parts. And this was uh, from a culture in ancient Iraq called the Sumerian culture. They were the first civilization on Earth, and a lot of the information that they have has been filtered through our modern day knowledge of math, sciences, education, and more importantly, astronomical <coughs> pieces of information. And as you can see here, we can just show a, a breakdown of the constellations that we've assigned to the 12 parts of the heavens. But in some of the other cultures, for instance, in Egypt, we're all familiar with hieroglyphs, of course I can't translate these for you, but I can point out here that on this stellar, we have some very interesting information that shows not only our solar system, but a more drawn out view of our universe that incorporates part of our solar system. Some of the symbols are actually highlighted here from the constellations that we're aware of, the scorpion, the bull, but you can see that this is part of a much larger diagram that's showing information, not just containing information about our solar system. So 
scholars today look at this and say, well, we're not really quite sure if they're trying to show us something about the underworld or how this works, but they have identified zodiac zodiacal symbols in these constellations and find it very interesting that it's got that much of a drawn out view of our universe. And you can see some of the detail here on one of the, on one of the corners. And again, just showing the different parts of the heavens and how they've been divided into 12 parts. And the way, the way this worked basically is at the time of halakhlial rising, if you go out right when the sun is about to rise and look towards the sun, you might still see constellations in the night sky. As the sun's rising, whatever the constellation the sun is rising in front of, that's the age of Aquarius, the age of Pisces. And that's how they were able to tell what time of, uh, what, what uh, area of procession we were going through as far as the zodiacal symbols. So some of the Sumerian artifacts, again, these are thousands of years old, also have zodiacal symbols on them and are telling us information from a culture that basically these, these tablets are in the realm of, you know, we're talking like 4,000 years ago, 2000 BC. We're at 2000, roughly 80, 2009. So if you go back 2000 years from AD to BC and then go back another 2000 years, 4,000 years ago, 2000 BC, these are all the artifacts coming out of the Sumerian culture that show all this information about the division of the heavens in 12 parts. And that gets, in, gets into a topic of the 12th planet, another planet that exists where not only did they cite all the astronomical symbols that we know of, but they said that the beings that visited them came from another planet within our solar system. I might touch on some of this in the lecture, but as I said, we're gonna kind of jam through this since we're doing this only in an hour. The power of flight. This is a very interesting topic because all throughout history we have depictions of flight, ancient man, putting wings on angels, putting wings on craft. Uh, it shows a fiery chariot in the sky. These are all depictions of the power of flight. And we see this recorded in all these various cultures. These are all from Sumerian artifacts found in e either ancient Iraq or Iran. And they show what we call the winged disc and has been symbolically uh, a representation of coming from the heavens down to earth. And we see this filtered even to the Egyptian cultures as the sun god Ra with this winged disc. But the Sumerian culture was the first one to have this representation of winged beings visiting man, and they call these beings the Anunnaki. And that term just simply meant those who from heaven come to earth. Uh, but very interesting depictions of great detail that would basically mimic a modern day angel. But these are coming out of Iraq and Iran thousands of years before the English translations of you know, depictions of wings as, as angels. These are Sumerian gods coming to earth. We can see the similarities of how this has been filtered into Egyptian mythology as well. Some of the artifacts that have come out of these cultures have been mislabeled. This one, uh, as you can see, was found in the tomb uh, in Egypt uh, of a pharaoh. And, uh, you know, these are labeled as a wooden bird model. Yet, when put together in a larger context of artifacts, this looks like a plane. These look like planes. And these were found in South America and labeled as insects, flying insects. They look just like a modern day prop plane to me. They've got the tail. And all these are aerodynamics of a plane, not of an animal or an insect. So, so it's a very interesting, uh, just a very interesting uh, you know, anomaly when we look at all the information from all the cultures around the world saying that they had a time where there was a power of flight taking place. And usually they attributed it to the gods. Now, that doesn't mean ancient man was flying around in spacecraft but they were seeing things and giving it a spiritual review. They didn't understand technology, they couldn't call it a spaceship, so they said, I saw God, I saw the essence of God, whereas today we're like, I saw an alien. So a lot of these depictions, again, this is just an interesting artifact, I thought, showing some type of context of coming down from the heavens. But all around the world, we have, throughout the cultures, this, this discussion of beings visiting man. And in the highest levels of every religion, it's just labeled as mythology. Here we have a very interesting fresco in a, uh, a monastery in Yugoslavia, and a very uh, infamous painting of Jesus on the cross. But as we'll see, and look how high up this is. This has been around since the 1500s. This isn't something that someone just wrote as, you know, nothing. We can see that there's great detail being shown here. And as you'll see, some of the objects in this painting show flying craft and human beings piloting this craft. What are they trying to show us? What does this mean? And uh, as you'll notice, as they go through the detail of this, there are you know multiple craft. It looks like a human flying that. But you'll also notice that the other people in this uh, drawing are shielding their face and are looking up at it in awe. 
And it's actually part of the drawing as far as the detail that they clearly are aware that these objects are there and the artist is making note of the people you know, uh, taking, taking notice. So very interesting artwork to come out of a Yugoslavia uh, fresco from the 1500s. See, they're all like, oh my gosh. So what are they trying to show us? And uh, you know, these, these drawings, again, is it a depiction of God or is that more to the line of what we would call a spaceship? Here's another interesting picture of the uh, Madonna painted by St. Giovanni. And you can see as a backdrop over her left shoulder, the artist has gone to such detail that they even depicted the man shielding his eye and the dog as well, and they're both looking up at the glowing disc in the sky. And this is famous artwork, religious artwork, that you know some people under further scrutiny have started to notice these details, and under our context of ufology, start to see the correlation of, that uh, looks like a craft in the sky. Glowing shields that they're pointing to, coming down from the heavens. So, a lot of these cultures uh, show this information. What I've chose to focus on is the most ancient culture that we have record of, Sumer, coming out of ancient Iraq. And this is just a small collection of books from Eric, Eric's uh, lead man, Zachariah Sitchin, who's done amazing work for 50 years looking into the Sumerian culture. And Sumerian culture, again, is basically that strip of land, Mesopotamia, uh, also known as Babylon, uh, today's modern-day Iraq, um, this is basically the cradle of civilization where we find the first complete, completed record of writing. And a lot of the, uh, many of the biblical tales that we have in a paper version, we have found the actual stone versions and they were excavated from here in Iraq. This is why you hear Mesopotamia, Babylon, Iraq, the cradle of civilization. The first culture on earth literally sprung up out of Iraq. Now that doesn't mean to say that there weren't groups or other uh, societies that existed. This is the first complete culture that we found, a civilization with written tablets, cities, a whole way of explaining their way of life. Here's their system of writing called cuneiform script. They sometimes wrote on semi-precious stones. They used what looked like an oversized screwdriver and turn it and twist it in clay and make all these characters. First language out of the, right out of the Stone Age has 400 characters. We think our, we work cool with our 26 letter alphabet. Many of these tablets, as Eric displayed, are still waiting to be deciphered. And uh, what's interesting about these tablet, tablets is they describe very interesting uh, areas of mathematics that the Sumerians were aware of. And this is the same thing that we still use today that has been filtered into our cultures. Remember I said that they were the first ones to divide the heavens into 12 parts? Well, they also used a system of, of math where it was basically uh, you know, a division of all these numbers that you see here of what we still use today, 12 hours in a day, 12 in a foot, 12 in a dozen. 12 months in a year. All of this came from the Sumerian information of a breakdown originally of dividing a, a, a system of time and starting off with the calendar by dividing the heavens into 12 parts. So they had very interesting astronomical information. Uh, this is just a very interesting seal that, inter interestingly enough, shows their planet Nibiru symbolized as a cross with its moon, and then the seven dots representing our Earth and our moon. We'll discuss that a little bit further, but they had some very ask <laughs> accurate astronomical information and as we start to look at some of these other areas you know the information that they say they learned everything they were taught was from these beings called the Anunnaki so all throughout history this interaction of God's visiting man has been recorded as mythology yet this Sumerian culture actually recorded in stone when they lived amongst their living gods just like the Bible said there were giants upon the earth so this predates all the information of the Christian understandings of giants upon the earth or depicting angelic beings with wings. The Sumerians described their gods, the Anunnaki, as beings that they physically live with and, and interact with. So it's just an interesting twist from what we have in modern day re you know, religions where we just say heaven's up there somewhere, but where is it? What are we talking about exactly? And it's just an interesting correlation of looking at how they, when we trace the origins of these biblical tales, the Sumerians are very specific in saying that their gods didn't just come from the heavens, they came from another planet. And this again is a depiction of a Sumerian god, and what I always like to show of interest, actually we'll go through a few of these slides, you can see again a depiction of a Sumerian god greeting a king, and, uh, and real quickly I always say that the people holding up that platform to make this happen, it's always a good saying, Zechariah makes it a joke, that they're taxpayers <laughs> allowing that to take place. So this depiction of a winged disc, are they actually trying to show us representations of flight? 
Um, we see these uh, artifacts and depictions in great detail and relief all over Iraq and Iran. I don't think they would go to this great detail of, of making these without trying to actually communicate something of great importance to us. We see these reliefs all over the place, again, with the taxpayers holding them holding the container. Uh, these wall reliefs, again, in great detail uh, all over Iraq and Iran. And what's interesting is this ancient symbology of depicting man as winged, winged being as the power of flight might seem odd. But in comparison to what we do today with modern symbology, when we landed the first astronauts on the moon, I don't think 50 years from now they're going to look at this and say, what were they doing, putting birds on the moon? <laughs> it's our way of communicating symbolically that we have the power of flight, just like the Sumerians were trying to say when they depict the Anunnaki with wings. So one of those uh, infamous sayings uh, when we first landed on the moon, of course, was Houston, the eagle has landed. And that, of course, correlates very closely to saying, you know, a depiction of wings as the power of flight. So this theory of ancient astronauts is one to say that, you know, who are we to say that we're not the first ones to go out and venture into space? When we look at all this evidence to say that we've been visited. Another area is very interesting is that, you know, a great catastrophe. Everyone in the modern era hears things of Armageddon or an asteroid impact. Uh, the Sumerians and many ancient cultures have information that really bewilders modern science in the sense that here's a map that was found in 1929 uh, believed to have been created in 1513, but derived from even earlier sources, and it shows the complete coastline accurately, and it shows the topography of Antarctica underneath the ice sheet, meaning if you go up to uh, you know, the, the north or the south pole, it's covered, the land masses, by miles thick ice, yet we have maps coming out of ancient history that accurately map this landmass underneath the ice. Unless they had ground penetrating radar, radar let alone how, how would they get up that high above the earth to see this, no one knows. The only other answer is that someone gave them this knowledge. 